Coming to you from Beaumont, this is your house call. On May 10th, the Food and Drug Administration approved the first COVID-19 vaccine for ages 12 to 15 years old. This is great news because this expands the vaccine eligibility to about 87% of the total U.S. population, which covers an additional 17 million children. And this couldn't come at a better time because one in every five people who are under the age of 18 are reported to have new infections. But many parents are skeptical and want answers about safety. And they want to know, is it even necessary to get vaccinated? Don't go anywhere. The House Call podcast is going to address your concerns on the COVID-19 vaccine and children. Hello and welcome to the Beaumont House Call podcast. I'm Dr. Asha Shahjahan. We're here to help you and your families live smarter and healthier lives. Today, we're gonna to talk about children age 12 and older who are now eligible to get the COVID-19 vaccine. Should they get it? What do you need to know? We have Dr. Bashara Frej, a pediatric infectious disease specialist at Beaumont Hospital in Royal Oak, joining us today. Dr. Frej, thanks so much for being here with us. My pleasure. So Dr. Frej, this is a game changer. Um, Pfizer has now approved their vaccine for 12 years and older. And it looks like, you know, about 20% of the COVID cases that are positive are within this age group. How do you think this is going to impact the numbers now of positive cases? So this will have a, a variety of impacts, uh, all positive, I would say. Um, so first of all, the uh, this age group you are describing, the 12 to 15, uh, is uh, accounts for a you know with the percentage you cited, uh, but also um, represents quite a few of the kids that we have seen admitted with severe pneumonia in the past several weeks during the most recent uh, surge uh, in in Michigan. Um, and uh, so we've seen a lot of uh, really ill patients uh, with protracted illnesses and preventing disease in that age group is very valuable for them. And uh, uh, that's one thing. And two, those who don't develop bad disease, uh, they have either asymptomatic infection or mild, mild infection, will not go ahead and spread this to other people around them, uh, whether within the family unit or friends at school or or on any sports team they may be on. So it's very important. Yeah, so it, I think a lot of parents think in general that COVID-19 doesn't affect children and it sounds like it, it does. So, uh, so first of all, that's a major misconception, unfortunately. Uh, what is known about it is that it it uh, the children weather the infection better than adults, that they are a little less likely to develop severe disease, and that the quote the numbers are less than adults. Now I want to qualify the numbers uh, issue because um, I mean this is people don't remember the beginnings of this uh, pandemic. Uh, so if we look back uh, into last spring, uh, we were not able to test children uh, because there was a shortage of reagents to do the testing. So, um, uh, and in fact, even adults had to be like really sick before a, a, a test is approved to, to be done on them because there was just such a limited supply of uh, product out there. So all the numbers that people cite, you know, that children didn't account for many kids, many patients in the past, you have to take that in the context of how testing was done. The, right now, testing is done, you know, basically, if you want to do it yourself, you can go and get it done at an urgent care. There are some kits you can do it at home. Uh, I mean, testing is all over the place. Uh, in my practice of infectious disease, Whenever I evaluate kids who've had uh, prolonged fever or recurrent fever, which is a common problem that I face in my, my office, um, the um, almost everybody has three, four, five COVID tests done before I even see them once. Um, so, uh, so testing is widely available, and as a result, uh, you pick up more numbers. The other thing is, even if the percentage of uh, kids that get really sick is small, 
um, when you're talking about millions and millions of people, this is still a large number of people getting really sick. And our uh, wards and our ICU have had their share of patients uh, with very severe illnesses who were previously healthy. Uh, you would not have necessarily predicted that they would struggle with this uh, virus, but they do. And, um, and so uh, it's a misconception that they can't get sick or that my son or daughter are very healthy and they are not the ones who are gonna get ill. Uh, yeah. The majority of kids I've taken care of were previously healthy and got very ill, uh, and uh, in addition to some that are high risk. Yeah, so it sounds like, you know, the the reporting might have been under-reporting in the past, and so that there is not necessarily more cases of children than there might have been in the beginning. And from what you're saying, it is still a big risk for our children, um, not only that they could get severe disease or get disease, or that they could spread it to others as well. So one of the big uh, problems we are facing with this virus is the fact that there is still a big chunk of the population that is unimmunized. These are the ones who already qualify for a vaccine and have chosen not to do it or are still on the fence about getting it. So this virus mutates a lot. And uh, this is what happens with these RNA viruses. And uh, if it mutates, it can mutate into uh, milder uh, versions of the virus or more severe versions of the virus. And um, and what happens is, uh, is, is if you don't prevent infection, you don't prevent replication. If you don't prevent replication, you can't prevent the emergence of variants. And some of these variants are gonna be um, resistant to the antibodies generated by vaccines. So it is incumbent on everybody to try to halt multiplication of the virus. So the virus doesn't care if I'm too sick or not sick. If it's replicating and plugging along and you know moving along from one human to the next, it's fine with the virus, um, but it's not good for everybody. Yeah, so I think it's really important that we really start considering vaccination. So for parents that are listening, can we talk a little bit about the safety of uh, vaccinating this age group? And can you maybe go over the trials and what was what was looked at? And for people that are concerned about safety, what can you tell parents about the uh, safety of the vaccination? The study uh, that was uh, the basis for the uh, FDA clearing the vaccine for this age group was done in about um, uh, over 2,200 teenagers between 12 and 15. And what they did was they randomized them into um, uh, the kids who got the actual vaccine, the Pfizer vaccine, and others who got the placebo, which is uh, a saline uh, injection. And uh, they compared the two groups uh, in terms of uh, side effects, uh, uh, and then uh, development of any COVID infection. And what they found was that uh, among those who got the actual vaccine, none of them developed uh, COVID infection. And among those that got the placebo, uh, there were about 18 cases of infection. So there was clearly a uh, a big difference between those who got the vaccine and those who didn't. So the ones who got it were totally pr protected from the compared to those who got the placebo. In addition, what they did was, uh, of course, they looked at side effects um, and uh, they compared the side effects of those who got the vaccine to a previous uh, group that was tested, which was the 16 to 25 year olds. And uh, they looked at the frequency of pain, you know, arm pain, fever, uh, fatigue, uh, headache, you know, all these various uh, adverse effects. And they found them to be very comparable to uh, the other, uh, the older age group. So it's essentially no difference in the frequency of side effects. And then they also looked at about um, the uh, just around 200 kids in that group and looked at their immune responses, how well they responded to the vaccine, not just that they didn't get infected, but what kind of an antibody response did they generate? And what they found is they generated antibody responses that were actually quite a bit higher mm. than uh, what the 16 to 25 year old age group generated. Uh, so they, they not only did not get disease, they had higher antibody levels and their side effect profile was totally similar to uh, the previously studied slightly older age group. 
Yeah, so that sounds great. It sounds like they're building greater immunity or um, responding well to the vaccine. Um, and then the side effect profile is similar. So can we just remind people what some of those side effects would be um, expected for this age group? So the most common side effect that's reported is uh, uh, injection site pain. So, uh, and having had the vaccine myself, I can tell you it's real. Um, <laughs> and but that's uh, and that's described in about uh, you know 80 to 85 percent of people who get the vaccine. But that lasts for a couple of days and goes away. Um, and then uh, there are uh, other complaints like headache and fatigue. A um, it's a small percentage, maybe 15, 20% may have some fever. Um, the side effects tend to be more after the second shot than the first shot. Um, and uh, But they are all transient. Uh, and uh, you know, for some people, it may be uncomfortable. Uh, but uh, for the majority of people, it's more of a nuisance than an actual, um, it doesn't prevent them from functioning and doing their schoolwork or jobs or whatever it is they're engaged in. Yeah, you um, might feel just some mild symptoms. and They are mild symptoms, and a lot of them are, you know, you get a Tylenol or a Motrin here and there, and it's sufficient to keep you going, and they're all brief. But the bottom line is all they're transient, not a big deal, and, uh, and people uh, tolerate it quite well. Yeah. And so when you say transient, it usually means about 24 to 48 hours maximum. So you might feel a little fatigued. You might have some soreness in your arm. But other than that, you should probably be able to do your everyday activities. So if you know parents are concerned about their children, um, it's probably going to be the same as when you had the vaccine. So that's pretty reassuring. Can so I make one other point about this? These sure. side effects are comparable to other vaccines that people get. Uh, so if you get the flu vaccine, I mean, the rates of these side effects are in the same ballpark. So it's not like worse than a flu vaccine. Um, and certainly for those who get the tetanus boosters, you know, the local pain is much more intense. So this is not, uh, these are not outlier side effects. They're, they're actually very commonly described in uh, all the other routine vaccinations that uh, people get as recommended. Yeah, and I think our, our kids are used to getting vaccinations more than adults are. So I think that they're pretty robust and they bounce back pretty quick. So when we're looking at some of the other trials that are underway, so for example, you know, this one was done for age 12 and older. Why are these studies broken into different groups by age? Like why why is it that they're picking, you know, 12 and older and then are they going to do ones for earlier, you know, maybe five years or even below that? And well, how do they decide between the age ranges? And then what do you also know about other trials that are underway for younger age groups? Children are not all the same in terms of their immunologic responsiveness, okay? So the 12 to 15 year old uh, generally are comparable to older adolescents. So it's easier to use the same formulation uh, that was done in adults, which is what they studied and, uh, and evaluate that. Once you start getting younger, uh, you start having to look at um, different uh, vaccine doses. So for example, uh, uh, some of the studies being done in the younger kids, which are, you know, ongoing down to six months of age right now, um, they are looking at three different dosage regimens, meaning the amount of uh, RNA in the product is uh, not the same as adults. So they're giving uh, like a quarter of the dose, half the dose and the full dose in three different groups and comparing side effects, uh, immune response. They're trying to see uh, what dose does a child really need um, uh, depending on their age. And this is, again, not something strange because we use, uh, there are vaccines that are, uh, the dosing is different depending on the age of the vaccinated person. The reason for breaking it down in this manner is uh, uh, because basically um, they, you don't want to mix uh, the six month old with the 10 year old, you know, because they're not exactly the same uh, mm -hmm. uh, uh, type of human, you know, their immune systems are at different stages. So they, they break it down into more, more homogeneous type of uh, children. And, um, and so that's, that's why the five to 12. Uh, and uh, that's actually, uh, right now, uh, a big percentage of the pediatric cases are in this age group, especially that MISC disease uh, that we uh, worry about the post COVID uh, immune uh, activation. Um, so I think um, they're just trying to do it in a systematic way and try to roll this uh, through uh, 
uh, without mixing kids who are not necessarily similar. Yeah. And so when people are thinking about, you know, the severity of disease, you mentioned MISC, if you could briefly talk about what that entails. Um, I, I just want to talk about the fact that there's a lot of parents that are worried about the long term side effects of getting the vaccination. But yes. I wanted to also emphasize some of the long term side effects of actually getting COVID. Is there a way that you can just sort of compare the two in terms of, you know, one, are there long term side effects to getting the vaccine? And then two, what are the long term side effects of getting COVID? So COVID, uh, COVID infection can uh, take many different uh, paths in, in anybody. So you can have the asymptomatic infection, the mild disease, the severe pneumonia and uh, uh, clotting in the lung. Uh, we right now have somebody in our ICU who had COVID a couple of weeks ago diagnosed and now has a lot of clots in the lung and infarcted lungs. Um, previously healthy, just overweight child. And then you have what is called post-COVID, uh, the immune activation, which is that multi-system inflammatory syndrome in children. Um, and this one is actually an overactive immune response to the virus, and uh, but the disease at attacks many organs such as uh, skin, uh, uh, eyes, etc. But its main target is the the heart, and these kids have bad heart inflammation, coronary artery abnormalities, um, and they are very sick children uh, who need a lot of aggressive uh, uh, immune modulating medications such as steroids, gamma globulin, uh, infliximab. Uh, so we usually, we work very hard on them. Uh, we've been very successful at reversing it. But uh, the children are sick for several days uh, and uh, typically in the ICU. Now, post-COVID, like if you recover, but the, the long-term studies are only happening now because COVID has not been with us, you know, uh, endlessly. It's just it's a relatively new disease. So all the long-term issues uh, will take a while to uh, uh, manifest themselves. So we're seeing uh, in the short term a lot of um, uh, mental health problems, especially in adolescents, uh, associated with all the restrictions that have come from COVID being around and not being able to attend school or do their normal activities. There has been an increase in um, uh, suicide attempts and admissions for suicide and depression. We've seen that here. The CDC has already published this. Uh, you know, they monitor things around the country, but it's reflected locally as well. Uh, so a lot of mental health problems. And then over time, people are beginning to look at long-term uh, illnesses. So, um, uh, so there was a recent study that looked at uh, what's called a new diagnosis with a year on, of, of having COVID. And they found like about 80 or so percent of people have had a new diagnosis uh, made in them. And a new diagnosis, meaning a new diagnosis of a chronic illness, or what do you mean by a new di diagnosis? Yeah, so something of a chronic nature. Um, that varies, you know, it can be psychiatric, it can be organic, you know, but uh, something new that they didn't deal with before. How long this would last, uh, we don't know. Uh, like, yeah. is this something that's going to be there for uh, like a year and then go away? Or is this uh, going to be a you know bigger problem? Uh, we don't know any of this. Right. But either way, it sounds like, you know, getting COVID-19 is very dangerous for our children with having the possibility of getting the multi-system inflammatory syndrome. And then all of these side effects that you're talking about in terms of having, uh, you know, gaining a chronic illness or having suicidality or mental illness. I mean, these are things that we do not want our kids to have. Um, Absolutely. And so I think that it, we are fortunate that there is a vaccine available that can help prevent this. And then from what you're telling me, Dr. Frege, is the studies look amazing in terms of the effectiveness of the vaccine on children. The COVID vaccine is the first mRNA vaccine. So the Pfizer and Moderna vaccines are mRNA based vaccines. They are the first to be approved for use, uh, 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 you know, formally. Uh, I know they don't have full uh, 
uh, approval uh, for for use. It's all emergency use authorization at the moment, but this is going to change. The companies have already submitted the paperwork to get uh, like full authorization, meaning it's not emergency use anymore. Um, the these although these vaccines are new, the technology is not new. There, there have been mRNA vaccines around for a very long time, uh, you know, at least a decade and longer. Uh, there are a lot of studies with other RNA viruses like Ebola and others, where they've uh, tried out these mRNA vaccines. There are a lot of animal studies uh, looking at safety, looking at effectiveness, so and and some long-term issues with the vaccine. And they are, they, you know, so they're not like somebody just thought about them last year and now they're on the market. Uh, they have a basis uh, of, uh, of like a whole uh, um Decades slew of, of, research. Of, of studies and research behind them. And that's why actually they could be rolled out so fast because that technology existed. Uh, it was just uh, this is this uh, imperative of the pandemic that led everybody to focus on trying to get something out uh, quickly. So, Dr. Fresh, what do you think about um, the changing guidelines of the CDC? Many parents are concerned that, you know, they look to the CDC for information, but sometimes it's confusing because the guidelines seem to change and change often. What are your thoughts on that? What I say to that is uh, they should be happy that the CDC revises their uh, recommendations based on the best available new evidence that they have. This is new to everybody. So the studies are going on in the, in the midst of the pandemic and uh, they are working very hard to uh, uh, collect the best information uh, from around the country and actually around the globe as well, and um, and uh, 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 modify uh, the the uh, the recommendations based on conditions on the ground. Uh, so when we drive a car, uh, we don't go one speed and in one direction. We, you know, we go fast, we slow down, we change lanes, we turn right, we turn left. So there's, it's it's not as simple as just do this for this long and it's over. The, the virus uh, uh, is changing. Uh, we have different types of people, some of whom are all for vaccination, some are hesitant, some are totally anti-vaccination, um, new variants emerging. So you should want a uh, an agency that looks at everything constantly and adjusts things to fit the current understanding, new information, uh, what's uh, good today, uh, what makes more sense today. And next week is another, you know, it may be changed a little bit. So people should not look at this as they don't know what they're doing. They should look at this as they know what they're doing very well and adjusting as more and more information accumulates and new data emerge and new trends emerge. So, um, so uh, that just, uh, uh, I just, it's a plea to the, uh, whoever is listening to this podcast, not to take it as a negative, but take it as a, as a very positive uh, uh, behavior by, uh, by the CDC and the FDA. Yeah, I love that analogy of the car because of the fact that we're driving towards the destination of getting to a COVID-free world. And we may have to, to break, we may have to speed up, like you said, we may have to change lanes or change directions. But our hope is that we all have the same destination in mind, and that's to get to a COVID-free world. And um, the way that we can do that is through vaccination. So if kids are starting to get vaccinated, what are some things that they can start doing now? Um, like, can they start playing sports and would they be able to go back to in live school? Like there's some benefits to getting vaccinated other than just the COVID-19 and not getting sick. What are some yeah. of those social benefits? So once uh, somebody is vaccinated and we know the kids, the kids uh, will respond well to the vaccine. Uh, the vast majority will as, as detailed in the studies. Um, and uh, these kids, once they are vaccinated, so if you're vaccinated, you are less likely to get infected. If you do get infected, that so-called breakthrough infection, these are uncommon, really uncommon, and uh, you don't really get sick either. And if you're not symptomatic, you're also much less likely to spread it to somebody else. So even if I get a breakthrough infection, uh, uh, and it's mild, the chance that I would spread it to somebody else is is very, very small. So it's a net winner and it allows people to 
to congregate and do the things they they want. So, so for example, the summer is coming. There's people. There are people who want to go to camps. There are people who want to do summer sports. There are people who want to hang out with their friends, um, and all of these things are things we all enjoy doing. And uh, and I think the vaccine allows us to to do that and get back to that uh, much, much faster than otherwise. Yeah, and I think, uh, you know, our kids have been working really hard this past year to just try to be as normal as possible. And it's been really hard not being able to socialize, you know, see grandparents, hang out with with their friends. And I think this is great news. And in my practice, I have lots of children that are like, I want to get this vaccine. They're so excited about it because they know that if they're vaccinated and their friends are vaccinated, they can now spend time together and they can, um, you know, hug their grandparents again and they can, you know, really just be part of what life was like before. And so I think that is just amazing and great. And, um, you know, we're really fortunate for the technology. And as you mentioned, it's not new technology. And I think a lot of people are hesitant and scared because of the fact that, you know, it's your children and you want the best for your children. Um, but I think when you think about the odds of, you know, what is severe disease and what this pandemic is doing to all of us, not only mentally, but physically, uh, you know, vaccination is sounds like the best route uh, to protect your child. So, um, I just I'm excited about it. Yes. Uh, and um, and uh, not just protect the child, but protect even the vaccinated people who uh, uh, against the emergence of new variants that may evolve in in, in children and the adults who are not vaccinated um, yeah. because that has the, the potential to derail a lot of things. So the sooner we you know, vaccinate as many people as we can, at least certainly the ones in which it's been studied and shown to be safe and, you know, and, and try to plug all these gaps in immunization, the sooner we can uh, put a lid on this thing and, and try to get back to some kind of normalcy. Absolutely. Uh, and so any tips for parents when they're taking their child for vaccination, anything that they should be prepared for ahead of time when they're about to go get their vaccine? Any special tips? There's nothing unique. And if a parent has had the shots themselves, they can tell them, oh, I had the same thing and it, it I was fine. And, you know, it's just going to be a little bit and, and, you know, just sort of reassurance. You know, yeah. the kids, uh, most of the kids, the, the trouble they have with uh, the the vaccination is the anticipation of an injection. It's not so much like once they get it, a lot of them are done, you know, and they snap out of it because it's over. So, uh, um, so it's all about reassurance and uh, and being being there for them and with them, and uh, you know, and uh, you know, they'll they'll take it. They they take it better than adults in the end. Yeah, I would recommend um, being very hi hydrated well, you know, make sure you drink plenty of fluids beforehand and avoid any Tylenol or Motrin before the vaccine because you don't want to inhibit the immune response. Um, and then, you know, just like uh, Dr. Fresh said, it's it's important to just sort of prep them that, hey, you might have some side effects and that's OK. Um, you'll be better in one or two days and then you'll be good to go um, after you get your full immunity. So, again, that, that that's a, there's a false note that as soon as you get your vaccine, you're completely um, immunized, but you have to wait for that, at least that two week period. And then if, after you get both doses as well, before you're considered to be feel fully immunized. So just, you know, keep that in mind. Um, and I think just prepping our children and knowing that, I think it'll, it'll help make it a smoother process. So what would you say to parents who are still maybe a little bit hesitant about getting the vaccine for, you know, either themselves or their children? So I, what I would say is I lead by example. Uh, you know, I, uh, I took the vaccine as soon as it became available to me. My son has gotten the vaccine. My mother's gotten the vaccine. Everybody in my family has gotten the vaccine. Uh, and anybody who's ever asked me about the vaccine, I say, go get it. No hesitation. Uh, so I can only lead by example, you know. Uh, you know so clearly, you know, I, I care about my family as much as anybody else cares about their family and the best thing was for them to get vaccinated and they have and they've done very well fortunately uh, so i i think um, uh, like nobody forced me to take the vaccine uh, it was just made available to me because i i work in healthcare, and i was more than happy to be one of the earliest people that could have gotten it so um so um 
you know, uh, I, if I told you to go get it, but I haven't had it myself, it's uh, it's uh, different story. <laughs> different story. This this virus does not distinguish between, uh, you know, uh, ethnic uh, background, uh, 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 social uh, socioeconomic status, etc. It'll infect anybody. Some people, because of health inequities, are at higher risk of problems uh, and uh, and complications. Um, and uh, but it'll infect anybody. Uh, so all it needs is a susceptible host. We all carry the receptors for the virus. And um, and we have to just interrupt its transmission and uh, vaccines, vaccines, vaccines. This is our ticket out. Yeah. So, I, you know, I think just the more you read, the more you're empowered. Um, if you have questions, ask your pediatrician about questions about the vaccine. And then, you know, once you feel comfortable, then, you know, you can go ahead and, and get your child vaccinated. But I say ask as many questions as as you need uh, to feel comfortable. Um, and the research is out there and it's promising. And so I think we're we're looking in good shape um, for our children to be back in school and back to the activities that they love. Well, that's all we have time for today. Uh, thank you so much, Dr. Fresh, for joining us and reviewing the, you know, some of the guidelines of uh, the current vaccine for children. And we're looking forward to maybe uh, vaccines, more vaccines being approved for children in this age group. It will come. I, I have no doubt that it will happen. Thanks so much for joining us. My pleasure. All right, podcast listeners, make sure you subscribe to our podcast to hear some of the latest information on COVID-19 and vaccines. We have several podcasts that are out now on the various vaccines and then also several on COVID-19 to help you stay informed. We leave you today with this healthy thought. If you're a parent who wants to protect your child, read up and get the facts. Talk to your pediatrician. Ask questions. Vaccines are a crucial way to end this pandemic. The Pfizer vaccine is safe and is recommended for children over the age of 12 by pediatricians. Everyone has had a tough time with this pandemic, especially our kids. By getting vaccinated, our kids have a chance to return to the activities they so missed and loved. Continue your journey to living a smarter, healthier life. Visit Beaumont.org slash podcast to access information and resources related to today's podcast.